Well, guys, if you'll turn to session number two, we're going to study today a lecture that I have said numerous times that if I only had one lecture to give before I died, this would be the lecture that I would give. The reason for that is very simple, is because if you do not have an understanding of the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, you're never going to be able to match up the Gospels with the writings of the Apostle Paul. You're going to find what appears to be double talk sometimes, and then you just read faster instead of hope and hope that no one catches it. And so what we're going to deal with today is the truth of this brand new covenant that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. So many times in our teaching, we teach items like forgiveness, eternal life, righteousness, justification, uh, identity in Christ, reconciliation, all of these things we teach like they're separate entities out there. But the fact of the matter is that all of these subjects, forgiveness, reconciliation, eternal life, all of these things are wrapped up in are you in the new covenant or aren't you? Are you forgiven or aren't you? It depends. Are you in the new covenant or aren't you? If you're in the new covenant, you're a forgiven person. It's a part of your identity. If you're in the new covenant, you're a justified person. If you're in the new covenant, you are a righteous person. If you're in the new covenant, you're a child of the living God. It isn't something you become or get. It's something you got. And so we have to understand the truth of these things. Now what we have done is, is with the cross, we realize that the cross from God's vantage point is the dividing line of human history. Most of us divide human history by the birth of Christ, B.C., before Christ, A.D., and I domini, the year of our Lord. And when we think about that, we think about that as it relates to the birth of Christ. But from God's perspective, that is not true. It's not divided by the birth of Christ, it's divided at the death of Christ. And so from God's perspective, he divided history at the cross. So the B.C. literally should be before the cross, and then the A.D. is an Italian word meaning after de cross. So you got before the cross and after de cross. Now let's see if that is true. I hope that you have a will. If you don't, the government has one for you. But a will is nothing new. It's been around since biblical times. And the author of the book of Hebrews wrote in regard to a will. Now when you have a will, oh, another word for that is a covenant. Another word for that is a testament. You have an old will, you have an old testament, you have an old covenant. You have a new will, a new covenant, a new testament. And it's a will. It's an agreement between two people. Now we're told in Hebrews that in case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is in force only when somebody has died, and folks, that is precisely the reason when the gospel is defined in the Bible, it talks about that Jesus died on a cross and was buried. The burial is the proof of his death. Why? Because a will will not go into a force until someone has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. And that's why even under the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and he sprinkled the scroll on all of the people. Now what we're learning here, folks, is this. Without the shedding of blood or a sacrifice, there is no forgiveness. Without a sacrifice and the forfeiture of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. After doing this, he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. Now, here became the problem. We couldn't keep it. In the same way, however, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And guys, if you mark your Bibles, mark this passage. Without the shedding of blood... 
there is no forgiveness. How many of you believe that to be true? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Now I want to ask you another question. Who shed his blood? Jesus. I'm going to ask you another question. If there was any further forgiveness to be executed on your behalf, what would Jesus have to do? Die again, would he not? Because without the shedding of blood, how much forgiveness is there? None. How many times did he shed his blood? Once. How many, for, for how many people? The entire world going back to Adam, forward to eternity. What is the only thing that you can conclude if you have an ability to reason in regard to your forgiveness? What Jesus cried out from the cross. It's finished. Do we live that way? Unfortunately not. Now, we need to understand that in order for God to usher in a covenant, unlike the old, where forgiveness had to keep occurring over and over and over again, we'll get into that in a, in a minute, that he had to send his son, Jesus Christ, who alone's blood was capable of covering and taking away the sins of the world. The blood of a bull and goat covered sin until the next time, and covered it until the next time. To put Jesus' blood on the par of a bull and goat is an insult to Jesus. That's why Jesus did not come to atone for sin. The word atonement is never used in the New Covenant. He didn't come to atone. That's what the blood of a bull and goat did. He came to do something far greater than cover sin. He came to take it away. And so he had to usher in a new covenant. Under the old covenant, there was a problem. I command you to keep it. They couldn't do it. And so a new covenant was ushered in. What was the reason for it? If there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with his covenant. Is that what it says? Oh, God forbid he didn't find fault with us. Not wonderful us. Yes, he did. He found fault with us. So as a result of that, this former regulation, this former covenant was set aside. Why? Because it was weak and useless. The law was set aside because it was weak and useless. Why? Because something wrong with the law? Uh-uh. Something wrong with us. That's why Paul said there's nothing wrong with the law. It's holy and good, but when it flows through me, all I can do is kill me. The law made nothing perfect. No man could ever be declared perfect in the sight of God through the law. So it was weak and useless to do what we had to have done to us to ever go into the presence of a living God. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. You know anybody that doesn't want to draw near to God? We all want to draw near to God. You can't do it through the law. The law keeps you from drawing near to God. The only way that you're ever going to draw near to God is when you know that your sins have been taken away and you can enter into the presence of Jesus, calling him Daddy, Father, and receiving mercy in our time of need. The old covenant replaced, the new covenant replaced the old. A time is coming, declares the Lord, well, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Why? Because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. So I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. Now, folks, some people read this and say, oh, this is a covenant just for the Jewish world. No, it was for both, which Paul later on describes. We're ministers of a New covenant. But what you had here was this. You had the Jews who had the law. Do you realize the Gentiles never were given the law? We were never given the law. We just went over and took it. But God never gave it to us, just to the Jew. And so here was the Jew all beat up by the law, standing there in raggedy clothes. The Gentile, he didn't have the law. He was naked. Now, if God is going to give a new set of clothes to both the Jew and the Gentile, first of all, what's the Jew going to have to do? Take off his clothes. 
What's the Gentile going to have to do? Get dressed. <laughs> and that's exactly what took place. To the Jew, he said, put off the old. You're no longer under this regulation and put on the new. To the Gentile, he said, put on the new. So what did we smart Gentiles do? We just went over and stole the old beat up clothes of Israel and put them over our brand new set of clothes and stand around and say, looking good. <laughs> Folks, God never gave us the law. He only gave that to Israel. But he gave grace to the entire world. First he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them although the law required them to be made. And then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first, the old covenant, to establish the second, the new covenant. And by this brand new will, this brand new testament, this brand new covenant that we have, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus, how many times? Once, and for how long? Forever. How many of you know right now that in the sight of God you're as holy as the Apostle Paul? How many of you know right now in the sight of God you're as holy as Jesus? Now you see, I'll tell you what I get on that. I get some people, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> You get others, amen. And then you get the, yep, you're right, you're right. <laughs> now, folks, I'm going to ask you again. If you have any holiness to you at all, being set apart, who did it for you? Did he make you holy? And that's what it says. You have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus. Did you sacrifice for anybody? Jesus sacrificed, and when he did, he made you what? Holy. Now, I'm going to ask you again. How many of you know right now in the sight of God you're as holy as the one who made you holy? Jesus. That's better. Okay. We're, get, we're, we're getting there. I'm not here to teach what the Bible says. I'm here to help us to understand what the Bible means. And when the Bible says something, it means something. You are a holy person. Now, that does not mean that you walk around, like I said yesterday, with your Bible under your arm and walking very nice and smiling at people. It means that you have been set apart for the divine service for which God created you. You have been set apart by the Word of God. You're different from the entire world because you believe in Jesus. You're not religious. That also sets you apart from the religious world because you believe in Jesus. You don't believe that all people are saved and we're all wonderful and you can, believe, you can, you can study the Koran or you can study the Bible, you, all of them are good. That's not a Christian who says that, that's a religionist. But you believe in Jesus and Jesus alone. You don't believe in the Koran, you believe in the Bible. You don't live under the old covenant. You live under the new covenant. And that's precisely why the Bible tells us you have been made ministers of a what? New covenant. Then why aren't the ministers ministering the new covenant? Why are we commingling the law and grace like the Galatians did? When he said we're supposed to be ministers of a new covenant. You have been made holy, set apart through the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete is aging and will soon disappear. Now, let me give you an illustration of that. How many of you have one of these in your home to enjoy your music? <laughs> now, if you were living back in the 20s, what, what would you have had in your home to enjoy Dave's records? Not that he was singing back then. <laughs> <laughs> that was called an old Victrola. And you'll find them in antique stores, or you'll find them people putting flowers in them. 
but you're not going to play music on them anymore. Why? It's been surpassed by something so far greater. I had, you know, 10 records, you know, the records that were 10 speed and all that stuff. I, not, people don't even know what those are today. They don't even know what a record is. And I hardly know what a CD is. But at any rate, <laughs> it's been replaced. It was very useful. If you wanted to listen to music back then, that's all you had. But God's replaced it with something so far greater and so superior to that that it would be crazy to sit around and listen to that today. So the Lord is a declaration of his new covenant. He said this, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they'll be my people. Now, folks, again, I want us to see something here. This is a quote out of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it reads, I will put my law in their minds and in their hearts. Because the law always meant the law of Moses. Well, then why did the New Testament writer say, my laws? The law was never referred to as the laws. It was referred to as the law. Because he's not talking about the law of Moses. He's talking about the laws of Jesus. To love your God with all your heart, your mind, and soul and to love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these two hinge the fulfillment of the entirety of the law and the prophets. So it's a change, my laws. I'll put my laws, Jesus' laws in our minds and write them in their hearts. And I'll be their God and they'll be my people. No longer will a man teach his brother saying, know the Lord because they all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Why? For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins. How often, guys? No more. The Holy Spirit also testifies about this new covenant. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. He says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. Do you believe that, guys? Is that good news? Your sins are remembered no more. And where these have been, not will be, if it was will be, then you're still getting forgiveness. When it has been, it's finished. Where these have been forgiven, there's no longer any sacrifice for sins. Is there any other sacrifice for sins? If you were asking God to forgive you today, would you be functioning by faith according to this new covenant? If you were thanking God for his forgiveness that he provided for you 2,000 years ago, would you be functioning by faith? You see the difference? Do you want to be a faither or do you want to be a traditionalist? What were the laws that replaced the law of Moses? This is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us, the laws of Jesus. A new command I give you, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By all this, by all men will know that you're my disciples, by your bumper stickers, <laughs> by your church attendance, by your tithing records, by your ecthus around your neck. Don't you wonder what the world did back then before... We had bumper stickers. I guess you put a placard on the tail of the donkey saying snort if you love Jesus or something like that. I don't know. But we've substituted all those things for loving one another. You know why? Because we can't love apart from Jesus. I can go to church apart from Jesus. I can sing the choir apart from Jesus. I can do all those things apart from Jesus. I don't need him to do those. I did them for years without him. But for me to love with agape love, I have to first of all be filled with his love before I have anything to pass on to you. A new priesthood. If you're going to usher in a new covenant, you need a new priesthood. The new priesthood replaced the old one. We're told if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, 
And then it explains to us, for on the basis of the Levitical priesthood, the law was given to the people, why was there still a need for another priest to come? One on the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron, not a part of the Levitical priesthood, but out of a different area altogether, a different line of genealogy altogether. Four, look at this, folks. Where there's a change in the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. Has there been a change of the priesthood, or are you still under Levi? Do you have a new priest? Who is he? Jesus. Then has there also been a change of the law? Sure has. This priesthood is superior. The ministry that Jesus has received is as superior to the Old Testament priesthood as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old covenant. You're talking about an old covenant and a new covenant that's superior to the old. And it's founded, it says, on better promises. For this reason, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance what kind of an inheritance do you have? It's called eternal inheritance. Is that good news? Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. We have a new priest. A new priesthood, a new priest. We have a perfect priest guaranteeing a better or a perfect covenant. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath. But when he became a priest, he became one with an oath from God when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, Jesus, are a priest for how long? Forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Guys, what's the value of a guarantee? The guarantor. And who's the guarantor? God. Who's the guarantee? Jesus. That is not a bad, that's Baron Sears robot, folks. <laughs> Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. And unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then the sins of his own people. He, Jesus, sacrificed for your sins, how many times? Once and for how long? All time when he offered himself. Not the blood of a bull and goat, but his own blood. The blood of God himself shed on a cross of such value that it took away the sins of the entire world. The law appoints as high priest men who are weak. But the oath, the promise of God, which came after the law, appointed the Son, who has been made perfect for how long? Forever. We have an eternal priest. I love this passage of Scripture. I don't know why it, gets, it tickles me. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. <laughs> have you ever noticed how death will do that to you? It'll just prevent you from continuing in office. We have Priest Levi, Priest Benjamin, Priest Flanagan. We got all those guys. They're right there underneath that ground. There's only one tomb that is famous for who isn't in it. And that's the tomb of Jesus Christ. All the rest of them, you can go dig them up. They're all there. Now because Jesus lives forever... He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, and wherever you see a therefore, you ask, what's it there for? And what it's there for is because of all of the things we've been talking about, because of the eternal nature of God himself, we have an eternal priesthood, and therefore, he, not you, is able to save completely those who come to God through him why? Because he always lives to intercede for you and for me.
that good news? How did he save you guys? Temporarily or completely? There's a lot of people who don't believe that. And I would venture to say, don't have a clue what the new covenant is. You and I have been saved completely. Salvation is like this. You see a guy out bobbing up and down in the water, and you're out in a boat, and you say, how can I save this guy? Well, some people think you save them by your good example. And you got people like that. I just walk around waiting on people to say, you're so wonderful. Are you a vegetarian? Uh, <laughs> And, and we think we're going to save people by our good example. Folks, you're not going to improve on Jesus' example, are you? And if Jesus' example couldn't save you, nothing's going to. We have to understand you're saved by truth. That doesn't mean that we go out and, you know, I've always told people there's no such thing as a worthless life. You can always serve as a bad example. But, <laughs> but the issue is that's not our goal is to serve as a bad example. But your example ain't going to save anybody. Jesus is going to save them. He's the example. But this guy thinks you do that by your good example. So he gets out and he does a breaststroke and then he looks around the guy's gone. And other people think, well, what you need is some information. You just need some more information. So he throws him a book on how to swim and, and, and all of a sudden he's gone again. So he says, well, I guess he can't read. We come up with all kinds of ideas. Guys, what salvation is or it should be at least, is you're in the boat, this guy's sinking, you go over, you lift the guy out of the boat, and you put him in the boat. Now, is that salvation? Should be, but on the way back. This guy asked for a cigarette and cussed, and I just pitched him overboard. <laughs> Now that is precisely how much of the Christian world perceives salvation. Yeah, you're in the boat, but you better mind your P's and Q's or I'm pitching you overboard. <laughs> Guys, to call salvation salvation, you cannot even call it salvation unless you've picked the guy out of the water, put him in the boat, and delivered him safely to the shore. Anything short of that's a reprieve. But please don't call it salvation. It's an insult to God to say, quite frankly, that you can lose your salvation. It's an insult to God who said, I will save you completely. Because what you're doing is saying, salvation's up to me. No salvation is up to him. And we insult the cross, which we will study in detail later. That the reason that I have eternal life is because of the eternal consequence of the cross. And when I deny that, I'm looking into the face of Jesus and saying you're a liar when you cried out it's finished. Salvation required a new sacrifice, not an old one. This sacrifice took away sins. It didn't cover it. We said the law is a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. The law is not a reality, it's a shadow. If I'm standing here and the sun is behind my back, what am I looking at? My shadow. It's not a reality, it's a shadow. If I turn to the sun, now where's the shadow? Back behind me. Why? Because I'm face to face with the sun. When I've had my back turned on Jesus Christ, I was looking at a, at a shadow, not a reality, of religion. That's a shadow. And the day that I left that shadow and turned to face Jesus Christ face to face, I leave the shadow behind because I'm face to face with Christ Jesus. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices. A sacrificial system that says you have to go back to the Day of Atonement every year to get your sins forgiven. A system that says you have to go to your confession booth to get your sins forgiven. A system that says you got to keep short accounts with God to keep your sins forgiven. It doesn't make a difference which one of those you're looking at. They're all the same. It's a denial of the finality of the cross. And for this reason, it can never by these same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to him to worship. If it could, would they have not been stopped being offered? That's why there is no more sacrifice for sins. It stopped being offered. 
because it was offered once by the Son of God and will never be offered again. The worshipers could have been cleansed once and for all, just like Jesus did, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. Why? Because it's impossible, guys, for the blood of bulls and goats to do what? Take away sins. Did the, bull, the blood of bulls and goats cover sins? Yeah, that's what's called atonement. Could have taken away? No way. Only the blood of God himself. It was necessary then for the copies of these heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he ever enter heaven to offer himself again and again and again and again. He isn't doing that. He offered himself once and for all and sat down at the right hand of God. So he doesn't enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the, most, the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that's not his own. If that was the case, then Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. Do you want Jesus to suffer again for your sins? He didn't want to either. But now we're told, he has appeared how many times? Once. For how many? All. At the end of the ages to do what? Do away with sin. By the sacrifice of who? Himself. Just as a man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed how many times? Once. To do what? Cover? No. Take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time. How many of you believe Jesus is coming back? When he does, he's not coming back to bear sin. Why? He's already done it. What's he coming back for? To bring salvation for those who are waiting for him. Atonement covered sins. Christ took away our sins. His sacrifice is final. Day after day, we're told in Hebrews, every priest stands. Why does he stand? Because his work's never over. A chair was a prohibited piece of furniture in the temple. So every day a priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never do what, guys? Take away sins. Did it cover them? Mm-hmm. Did it take them away? No way. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered again for how long, folks? All time, one sacrifice for sins. He sat down. Do you know why he sat down? His work was over. Just like he cried out from the cross. It's finished. It's done. It's over. I'm not dealing with you on the basis of sin. As we will learn in the lecture on life, there's a consequence of sin called death. And that's what my resurrection is going to deal with. He sat down at the right hand of God and since that time waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Why? Because by one offering or one sacrifice, here's another one, guys. He has made perfect forever those who are the holy ones. Now, who are the holy ones? How many of you are one of the holy ones? What else did he do for you? Made you what? Perfect. Now, you know what that means? It means complete. In him you have been made what? Complete. Now when you're made complete, is there anything to make you completer? <laughs> I don't think so. If you've been made complete and been given everything you need for life and godliness, how much do you need? What he wants you to do from that point on is to begin to find out your inheritance and walk in it. You're not going to get something new. You've already gotten everything you're going to get. Just learn what it is and walk in it. We try to add to what God has done. It's like Mona Lisa. Let's say this guy, man, he loves Mona Lisa. And one day he hits the lottery, gets millions of dollars and says, man, I'm going to Paris and I'm going to go to the Louvre and buy Mona Lisa. 
And he goes over to France, and he bargains with the people at the Louvre, and he finally is able to offer enough money for them to say, you got her. So he pays these millions of dollars for Mona Lisa, and he very carefully packs her up, and he very carefully carries her back, very carefully back to the United States, and he takes her to his home and carefully unwraps her and puts her up on the easel and looks back at her and gazes at her with admiration, but he says, hmm, I think I could improve on that. And so he gets out his little paints and starts dabbling with Mona Lisa. And pretty soon, this is what she looks like. He has ruined the master's work. That's what we're doing in religion, ruining the master's work. He's already made you complete. How are you going to make yourself more complete? He's already made you holy. How are you going to make yourself more holy? He's already sanctified you. How are you going to make yourself more sanctified? We're like painting a mustache on Mona Lisa and thinking we're doing good. He said to rest. You can't rest and be painting mustaches on Mona Lisa. That's the master, folks. This is the work of a master. But we in our salvation have the work of the master. Quit dabbling with him. Enjoy your completeness. There's no more sacrifice for sins. He adds, there's sins and lawless acts. I will remember no more. And were these not, go catch the verbiage, where these have been forgiven, not will be forgiven, where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. Is that true? Any more forgiveness to be executed on your behalf by God? I mean, guys, you've got to think this through. You see, we look at Christianity as mystical. It isn't mystical, it's practical. It's the most practical thing on the face of the earth. That if I, Bob George, was ever going to go into the presence of a holy God, God was going to have to do something for me because there's no way I could go into the presence of a holy God unless he made me holy. I couldn't make myself holy. I couldn't make myself acceptable to go into the presence of a holy God. He had to do that for me. There's no way that I could go in getting my sins forgiven on my own. He had to do that. He had to take them away. But he did. And he says, I'll remember their sins no more. So that where these things have been forgiven, there's no longer a sacrifice. Once I've done this, Jews, put aside your atonement. Put aside your day of atonement. It's no longer there. Catholics, you wasted your time with your confession booths. And Protestants, you're really wasting your time with your 1 John 1 9s. Because it's over. It's finished. You are a forgiven person. In the New Covenant, you're a forgiven person. Two passages of Scripture that the legalists have tried to hammer the daylights out of Christians with. And these passages are talking to them, not to you. Hebrews, if we deliberately keep on sinning, now I want to ask you a question. The book of Hebrews is a book about what? Faith. What is the definition of sin? That which is not of what? Faith is sin. So what's he talking about when you keep on sinning? Keeping on in your unbelief. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of truth, what are we sinning against? The knowledge of truth. You have received the knowledge of truth that Jesus has done it all. That Jesus took away the sins of the entire world. Now you keep on sinning against that truth. He says there is no sacrifice for sins left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. That to me is serious talk, guys. If you've received the knowledge of truth where Jesus said it's finished and you are sinning against the knowledge of that truth by saying, no, it isn't finished. You've got to keep yourself forgiven. He says, I didn't say that. He says, you're in danger of the raging fire of hell because you're kicking Jesus right in the face who said that it's finished. I didn't say that. God did. 
Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves, doesn't say he will, but deserves to be punished, who's done what? You see the context of this? Trampled the Son of God underfoot. Treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and has insulted the spirit of grace. Do you realize what we're doing, folks, when we keep trying to add to what God said is over? We're insulting the spirit of grace that brought it about. We're treating as an unholy thing this blood of the covenant. Most of us have never even heard of a new covenant. I've never heard a lecture on the new covenant except the ones I've given. I've never heard one. I'm not saying they're not given. I've just never heard one. You see, folks, we can play around with a lot of things, but you can't play around with the Son of God. God sent his son to do something for us. And here's the testimony of God concerning his son. That I've given you eternal life. And this life is in his son. And he who has the son has life. And he who does not have the son of God does not have life. It means you're dead. And these things I've written unto you who believe in the name of the son of God in order that you may know that you have something. What? Eternal life. And when you don't have the Son, you don't have eternal life. You're dead. And if you die without the Son, you die dead. And you remain dead to God through eternity, according to the Word of God. So I'm not going to treat as an unholy thing the blood of this covenant that set me apart. And I'm not going to insult the Spirit of grace that sent Jesus to this world to die on a cross to take away my sins. I'm going to thank him for the rest of my life. Another one is in Hebrews 10. Look at this one, guys. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, a person like Judas, who has tasted, you'll notice the words here. He's not saying you drank of anything or, or ate it. You tasted. This is people tasting religion. Who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance. Do you know why you can't be brought back to repentance? Have any of you ever tried to come back from where you haven't been? <laughs> Are we all alive? <laughs> Have you ever come back from where you haven't been? No, of course not. And you can't be brought back to repentance because you've never been there to begin with. You've been given lip service, but you've never made what is called in the scripture repentance, which is as strong as horseradish. Now, we use repentance. I used to smoke. Now, I don't know that you could start again. Used to drink. Now, I don't know you could start again. This repentance is a total change of heart and mind. And it's the only place it's used in the scripture is in regard to salvation, a total change. I say it's like your breakfast this morning of bacon and eggs. The chicken made a contribution to it. The pig, total commitment. Now we're talking about pig stuff when you're talking about repentance, not talking about a contribution. It's a total change of mind. And here you had the Jews who were saying, yeah, Jesus died for all my sins. Well, where are you going? Back to Jerusalem? What for? To get my sins forgiven? Going back to the Day of Atonement? I thought you said Jesus took away your sins. Oh, yeah, I believe that. Where are you going? Back to Jerusalem. What for? Go to the Day of Atonement. What for? To get my sins forgiven. I thought you said that Jesus died for all your sins. Oh, yeah, I believe that. Where are you going? Confession booth. What for? To get my sins forgiven. I thought you said Jesus died for your sins. Yeah, I do. Where are you going? Confession booth. What for? Get your sins forgiven. I thought you said Jesus died for all your sins. Oh, yeah, I believe that all my heart. Where are you going? Go, go, go down and answer the altar call. What for? Get my sins forgiven again. Go to 1 John 1, 9. Get my sins forgiven again. I thought you said Jesus took them away. Oh, yeah, I do. What are you doing? 1 John 1, 9. Get my sins forgiven. Guys, can you see the double talk? Do you see why we're confused? A double-minded man is unstable in how many ways? Always. That's double-mindedness. That's out of one side of your mouth you're saying, oh, praise God, died for all my sins, past, present, and for future. Just 
pound the Bible right down through the top of the pulpit and turn right around the next breath and say, but if you confess your sins, he'll forgive you. Now, which is it? This Christian world's in a mess, folks, because we become double-minded in our belief system. When Jesus says it is finished, it is finished. That's why this book of Hebrews is written, to get us to see something. If you fall away, you can't be brought back to repentance because you've never repented in the first place because, and he tells you, because to your loss, you're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. If there is any further forgiveness to be executed on your behalf, Jesus would have to hang on a cross and die again. Do you want him to do that? The people say, but it makes me feel good. Well, in other words, do you want to believe, want to bring Jesus back and beat him half to death and hang him on a cross so that you can feel good? If you want to know what feeling good, folks, is rest in the finality of the cross. You'll never feel so good when you realize it is over. It's finished. I didn't deserve any of this. Certainly didn't earn it but I'm going to rest in it. What's the conclusion concerning this? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There is your sins. The, he remembers your sins no more. There's no longer any sacrifice for sin. It's over. Now, we're told that we have been given a new ministry. You and me. He has made you and me competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the old covenant, not of the letter of the law, but of the spirit. For the letter of the law kills, but the spirit gives life. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters of stone, came with glory, so if the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Now, folks, this annihilates this thing that, that we're no longer under the ceremonial law, but we're still under the Big Ten. What's he talking about here, ceremonial law or the Ten Commandments? He's talking about the Ten Commandments. When Jesus came, or when Moses came down with the tablets, so that the Israelites couldn't look steadily in his face. That's the Ten Commandments. And he's saying, now the Ten Commandments, let me just make it clear here, are just as strong today for the lost as they, are, as they ever were. That's what they're there for, is to show the lost that they're a sinner so that they'll turn to Christ for salvation. That's why we still need them in our courthouses. <clears throat> now if... The Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, that's the Ten Commandments. How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glory, the, the old covenant, the, the law, has no glory at all now in comparison to the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory... How much greater is the glory of that which lasts? For how long? Forever. The old covenant, man reaching up to God with self-effort to be accepted by God. That's the way the Jews used to pray. They prayed like this. Why? Because God was up there and they were down here. A Jew never knelt to pray. A prayer, uh, they stood and held their hands up. People still doing that today. And again, I don't care what you do with your arms. Uh, you know, how important would that be if you didn't have arms? So I don't care whether they're lifted or in your lap or stuck in your ears. Just don't think that's holy. But your body language should have some relation to what you know to be true. I personally am not reaching up to God anymore because he has reached down to me. So God reached down to me through Christ Jesus with love and acceptance. Religion is trying to reach God. New covenant is God has reached you. How do you get people to let go of these traditions that kill us and these laws that kill us? How do you do that? It's like his baby with his teddy bear fell out of the playpen. He's crying and yelling and screaming like a demon. Just, am I, give me my teddy bear back. You say, how in the world am I ever going to teach that kid to let go of that old stinking teddy bear? That thing that kills you. Real simple, buy him a puppy. 
When you got a puppy, you find out it's alive. You find out that the puppy can lick you, and you can lick the puppy. You got a relationship with each other. And after a while, you become so engrossed and infatuated with this living being that that old dead teddy bear has no meaning to you at all anymore. You fall in love with the living Jesus, and that old dead law has no place in your life anymore. Why? You're in love with the living Jesus. We're ministers of reconciliation. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We're under a new covenant. And all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and he gave us this ministry of reconciliation. What is this ministry of reconciliation? God was reconciling the world to Christ, to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. What's the practical application of this? Are you willing to enter God's rest? We're told in Hebrews that therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, it's still there for you today. Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. We're told that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. He wants you out of the desert. He wants you to go into the promised land where you eat from trees that you didn't plant and dig from and drink from wells that you didn't dig. There's a Sabbath rest waiting you. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. So many times our Christian experience, folks, is like this hitchhiker was out there trying to get a ride, and a guy picks him up in a pickup truck, and drives down about 10 miles and looks at the back, and here he's sitting with this load on his back. He stops the truck and says, Sir, for goodness sakes, put that load down on the back of the truck. Oh, no, sir, I don't, I don't want to bother you that much. I just need a lift. <laughs> and that's the way we are. God, I just need a lift to, to heaven, but I'll carry my own burdens. He said, Cast your cares upon me, for I care about you. Put your burdens where they belong. And that's on Jesus. Are you willing to die to self-effort? Trying to make results take place when results are always in the hands of God. And rest in the saving grace of Christ Jesus. Man under the law says, look what I'm doing for you, God. Under grace, Jesus says, look what I did for you, man. Under the law, man said, look at how I went to church. Jesus says, look at how I went to Calvary. Man says, look at how I was raised in my denomination. Jesus says, look at how I was raised from the dead. Man says, look at how I gave my money. And Jesus says, look at how I gave my life. Man says, look at how I confessed my sins. Jesus says, look at how I took away your sins. Man says, look at how I stood up against sin. And Jesus says, look at how I died for sin. Man says, look at how I judged the lost world. And Jesus says, look at how I came to save the lost world. Man says, look at how I marched against evildoers. And Jesus says, look at how I suffered for evildoers. Man says, look at how I bowed down to you. And Jesus said, look at how I became one of you. Man says, look at how I healed the sick. Jesus said, look at how I raised the dead. Man says, look at how I spoke in tongues. Jesus says, look at how I spoke in love. Man says, look at how successful my life was. And Jesus said, look at how successful my death was. Are you willing to enter into this new covenant with full assurance of faith? Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened up for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Folks, we've held on to the law. We've held on to self-effort. Go out and sick him for Jesus instead of let Jesus live his life in and through us. 
And, and, and we don't know how to do that because I've been doing it all this time and we're like this guy in the trapeze, he's going out and he knows that if he grabbed a hold of that other bar, he'd go to the other side, which is where he wants to go desperately, is into that rest. But I'm afraid to let go. So maybe I'll do it the next time. And most of us end up like this. We're hanging on to the law and we're hanging on to grace. We're hanging on to our works and we're hanging on to his works and hope he combines the two. And there comes a time in our life when we finally let go of, the, of recognizing that I'm no longer under the law. The law kills, but the Spirit gives life. And that Jesus is alive, living in me. And he's my hope of glory. It's not some words that we use, it's a reality. Christ is alive. He indwells us. And he leads us into his paths of righteousness. And we let go and go to the other side wondering, what in the world took me so long to get there? What was I holding on to? It says, therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Guys, our entering into the presence of God reminds me of this picture of John Kennedy during his reign as president. This is a picture of one of the most powerful offices in the world, the Oval Office of the White House. This was a time of extreme crisis in our country where we were that close to getting into atomic warfare with Cuba and Russia. That's a very serious meeting, and they all look serious, don't they? If you'll notice very closely at the front of the picture, there's a shoes, a pair of shoes there, and if you look closely between John Kennedy's legs, there's another shoe. Where'd those shoes come from? John John. How'd he get in there? Do you think John John had to say, to go through a security guard to get in there? Do you think he had to get an appointment with the secretary to get in there? Do you think when he entered in that John said to him, now you little dickens, do you have any unconfessed sin in your life? Because if you do, don't come in. John, John bound into the Oval Office. Why? Because he's daddy's, the president's his daddy. And you say, you dumb kid, don't you know that's the president of the United States? Yeah, but he's my daddy. And he says, that's the way we're supposed to enter into the presence of God. He's God, but he's your daddy. And therefore, we have the privilege of going into his presence and calling him Daddy Father. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way, according to this gracious covenant, the Lord treats his people as if they had never sinned. Practically, he forgets all their trespasses. Sins of all kinds, he treats as if they had never been as if they were quite erased from his memory. Oh, miracle of grace. God here does that which in certain aspects is impossible to him. His mercy works miracles which far transcend all other miracles. Our God ignores our sin now that the sacrifice of Jesus has ratified the covenant. We may rejoice in him without fear that he'll be provoked to anger against us because of our iniquities. You see, he puts us among his children. He accepts us as righteous. He takes delight in us as if we were perfectly holy. He even puts us in places of trust and makes us guardians of his honor, trustees of the crown jewels and stewards of the gospel. He counts us worthy and gives us a ministry. This is the highest and most special proof that he doesn't remember our sins. Even when we forgive an enemy, we're very slow to trust him because we judge it to be imprudent to do so. But the Lord forgets our sins and treats us as if we had never erred. Oh, my soul, what a promise is this. Believe it and be happy. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We in our own strength and flesh could never dream up this plan. We would have us involved in it some way. But you didn't need our advice. You planned in the heavenly realms to save us from the wages of sin, which is death, by the gift of God, which is life in Christ Jesus. 
In order to do that, you had to take away the cause of death, which is sin. And that was all a part of this new covenant, the first part of it, where sins were taken away so that we are able to receive eternal life through your resurrection. We thank you for this plan, Father, and we thank you for carrying it out with your son. It cost him his life and suffering. And we have the privilege of entering into that rest where we're resting from our works just as you did from yours and allowing you, the living Christ, to now live your life in and through us. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake.